Um, my name is Heather Sigali with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center, and this is part of our monthly lecture series about different science topics. Um, we have covered a lot of environmental science topics, earth science topics, um, we have covered food issues, and now we're into nutrition, and this is a new one for us, but I'm really, this is, this is a topic that I'm particularly interested in. And um, I saw this come across the UC Davis Newswire. I get like a daily <laughs> update of all the news stories. And I read about Dr. Stanhope's research, and I was like, I'm going to call her right away. <laughs> I think I sent an email. And um, luckily, we were uh, fortunate enough to have Dr. Stanhope come all the way up from Davis for us to present on some of the latest research. So Dr. Stanhope uh, received her Master's of Science and her PhD from UC Davis. Go Aggies. <laughs> and she's currently an associate research scientist in the Department of Molecular Biosciences at UC Davis. And um, 150 research projects. It's pretty exciting. Lots of projects. And so I know she has a lot of information to share with us. Um, all right, Dr. Stanhope drove all the way up from Davis for us to give us this special presentation. So let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> So, in keeping with the fact that I left my formal presentation clothes on my bed at home, <laughs> I'm going to make this a little less formal than my usual presentations. Um, it is still going to be kind of heavy on the science, and therefore, when I am saying something that you don't get, you don't understand, please raise your hand and ask. If we get too far behind, then I might say, let's hold questions till the end. But I do want you to understand as I'm going what I'm talking about. OK. So our question of the day is, does sugar consumption contribute to the epidemics of cardiovascular disease and diabetes? Now, before we answer that question, though, we're going to have a little primer on sugar. I'm going to be saying <laughs> sucrose, fructose, glucose, and high fructose corn syrup over and over and over again today. I want you to be very clear on what they are. First of all, let's talk about the sugars that actually occur in nature. There are four major sugars, glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, and lactose, and that's five. Let's not call maltose really major. Now, glucose and fructose actually have the exact same molecular composition. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. So they ought to be kind of similar. But their structure is different. Glucose is a hexagon. Fructose is a pentagon. When I talk about glucose, when I talk about fructose, I'm talking about them occurring alone as a monosaccharide, one <coughs> sugar. Now, it's important to understand, though, that while they occur in nature as monosaccharides, glucose actually occurs in nature in unbelievable quantities because if you take glucose and make it into chains, you have starch or complex carbohydrate. And so glucose is the basic component of wheat, oats, <coughs> rye, beans, pretty much any grain you can name. Glucose is the basic component. But the difference between glucose and starch is those glucoses are all attached to each other in intricate, long, long, long chains. Now, fructose only occurs in nature all by itself as a monosaccharide. Both of the sugars are in fruit as monosaccharides. The only place in nature that you can consume lots of glucose or lots of fructose as a monosaccharide is as honey. Honey has very significant amounts of both. Now, sucrose is a disaccharide, meaning two sugars connected together, one glucose, one fructose. In terms of sweetness, we rate sucrose as a one. We rate glucose as 0.7. It's 70% as sweet. 
whereas fructose is 1.4, 40% sweeter than sucrose. So fructose is the sweetest, then sucrose, and then glucose is not as sweet. Okay. Now, maltose is two glucoses attached together, and that's useful for you to know because you'll see maltose on many food labels more and more. Um, the food industry is using maltose as an ingredient. Okay, lactose is milk sugar. It's one glucose, and it is galactose. Galactose is another monosaccharide. We don't study galactose too much because you eat galactose and it instantly gets turned into glucose in your intestine. So your body deals with galactose <coughs> similarly as if it were a sucrose. All right, now the other sugars in nature, there's lots of sugar alcohols and you've seen these on ingredient labels, xylitol, sorbitol, mannitol. Now, one of the reasons, though, they don't use these sugars to sweeten cakes and candies in large quantities, these sugar alcohols tend to um, cause um, gastrointestinal distress. You don't absorb them well. They go straight through to the large intestine and pull water in. Diarrhea is the result. Um, so. You'll see this one more and more. It is being used as a sweetener, and, but it also causes gastrointestinal distress. This one is the smallest sugar alcohol, and it's becoming quite popular because it doesn't cause any GI problems because it's so small. It is also almost calorie free because it goes straight through. It does not get absorbed. And then the latest sugar product comes from a stevia, which is a plant. You can actually take a leaf off a stevia plant, eat it, and it tastes sweet. But it also has a lot of bitterness to it, too, because there's a lot of other compounds in it. So they have isolated steviocide and roboticide from the stevia leaf to make a sweetener that is 300 times sweeter than sucrose. And this is a sweetener you're going to hear more and more and more about. So these are naturally occurring sweeteners and sugars. But we have lots of sugars that aren't naturally occurring. Now, certainly, sucrose, I said you couldn't really eat very much of it in nature. Um, fruit, maybe 2 to 6 percent of fruit is sucrose. And even the sugar cane, if you went to a field of sugar cane and started chomping on a sugar cane, only 10 percent of that plant material you consume is sucrose. However, as you well know, we got very, very good at isolating the sugar out of the sugar cane or out of the sugar beets and making pure sucrose, pure table sugar. Now, it comes white, brown, or raw, makes no difference. All right, it's all the same. The other place that you can get quite a bit of sucrose is maple syrup, which is 66% sucrose. Maple syrup right out of a tree is only um, about 5% sucrose, but again, they concentrate it all the way up till it's at least 66% um, sucrose. They have to do that. That's by law what equals maple syrup. Okay, then we have corn syrup. Now, corn syrup is a um, has been for many, many, many years only a glucose syrup. It basically you take cornstarch. You add an enzyme, or you can even just add an acid, and all those little bonds between the glucoses break up, and you get a syrup that is 100% glucose. You can still buy 100% glucose syrup as caro syrup in the grocery store. Now, the confusion, the FDA disapproved 
does not allow the corn syrupers now to call their high fructose corn syrup corn syrup because corn syrup is simply glucose. To turn corn syrup into high fructose corn syrup, you need to use an enzyme way up there called isomerase. Isomerase actually occurs in the body too. You can take fruct eat fructose and in the body an isomerase enzyme can turn it into glucose. Well, Japanese scientists figured out, well, if the body can do it, we can do it too. And that's exactly what they do. You take a glucose syrup and you can turn it into a syrup that is up to 90% fructose. Then the corn syrup refiners can make high fructose corn syrup pretty much to be almost any composition they want. They can have it contain as little as 42% fructose by just adding more glucose syrup back. Or they can have a high fructose corn syrup that's up to 90%. Now, we're told normally that all the high fructose corn syrup that is used to sweeten soda is 55%. That's interesting, they keep saying that's true. However, uh, just lately, a scientist at um, UC San Diego um, published a study in which he measured the fructose content of all the sodas um, available in the grocery store. Many of them, in fact, most of them were well over 55% fructose. Many of them were 60 to 65, including the two most popular, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. So it's kind of interesting that the, it's a problem with our food labeling system that the corn syrupers are allowed to make a product that they really don't have to tell us what's in it. They just say high fructose corn syrup and they can put as much fructose in it as they want. You'll see later why that's a concern. Okay, there's also agave syrup. Agave syrup is mostly fructose. It is usually um, about 90% fructose. And again, the sugar alcohols, like I said, we process them and use them as sweeteners. Here is the processed sugar substitute, which at this point in time probably has the most um, potential to becoming something that people can actually use as a replacement for sugar in their not just drinks, but in baking. This product is a mixture of erythritol and from the stevia leaf, the rabata side. Just a tiny bit of this to make it sweet enough, and then this to make it non-caloric, but also to make it look like sugar crystals. It pretty much looks very similar to regular <coughs> table sugar. It has almost no calories, and um, it can be baked, which is a lot of the sugar substitutes cannot be baked. Um, I used it last November to make all our Thanksgiving pies, and I thought it was a very successful experiment. It was especially good in the cherry rhubarb pie because this erythritol kind of has that alcoholic uh, taste in your mouth, that menthol sort of explosion, so it made it tart and kind of uh, tangy at the same time. So, that is our sugar primer, and again, it's probably more than you wanted to know, but today I'll be talking about the sucrose, the high fructose corn syrup, but also the glucose and the fructose. So, moving on. Now, there is tons of epidemiological evidence that sugar consumption is related to metabolic disease. The people who eat the most sugar are the most obese, or they have the most visceral fat. Visceral fat is that intra-abdominal fat that is associated with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. It's not the subcutaneous fat that's 
immediately under your skin. Fatty liver, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic syndrome. And of course, metabolic syndrome is when you have combinations of risk factors of all of these. And there's several, I don't have on here, hypertension, but there's definitely studies also showing that sugar um, is related to hypertension. And again, all of these are occurring most often in the people who consume the most sugar. However, this of course does not prove that sugar consumption causes these problems. Association does not equal cause. So, to know, to prove that sugar causes these problems, we have to have direct experimental data. And of course, that's what we get when we have group A consumes sugar, group B does not consume sugar, or they consume a different kind of sugar, and hopefully A and B don't have any idea whether they're eating sugar or not eating sugar, and they do exactly the same thing, and you try to hold all the variables to a minimum, and then you look at the results and see who had the biggest increase in risk factors for these diseases. That's direct experimental evidence. Well, we do have some about sugar, and in August of 2009, the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee looked at that evidence and they looked at the epidemiological evidence and they announced, all right, women should not be consuming more than 100 calories of added sugar per day. And men should be consuming no more than 150 calories per day. A lot of people went, whoa, that's not very much because how many calories worth of sugar are in a can of Coke? 150, so women are very, very, very limited on how much Coke they can drink. Then, just nine months later, ten months later, the report of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee on the Dietary Guidelines for America 2010. They suggested a maximal intake level of 25% or less of total energy from added sugar. Now this was a little surprising, and just to show you how different that is, I made this little graphic. Here is how much Coke a woman can drink per day on the Dietary Guidelines for America based on this 25% maximal level, this much. And here's how much they can consume on the American Heart Association. Here's for men. Dietary Guidelines, Men, American Heart Association. So what gives here? These are two groups of scientists, and presumably they're looking at exactly the same evidence. Well, let's look at the evidence ourselves and try to figure it out. There is clearly controversy. Okay, so when we look at the evidence, we're going to start looking at the effects of sugar consumption on body weight and visceral adiposity, lipid, metabolis lipid metabolism, and insulin sensitivity. Um, we're going to be looking at first the effects of fructose versus glucose. Those are their two monosaccharides. Then we're going to try and figure out why fructose has such negative metabolic effects compared with glucose. And then we're going to look at the evidence that suggests that the sugars we eat, which are sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, that the, there's evidence to suggest that these sugars have very similar negative effects comparable to fructose. But before I get started, this is the question I get asked by anybody in the food industry. So if there's anybody in the food industry here, you want to say, why in the world do you study, why in the world do you even talk about fructose and glucose when foods are not sweetened, the processed foods are not sweetened with fructose and glucose? 
They're only sweetened with sucrose or high fructose corn syrup. So why even bother to study it? Well, there's a reason for that. First of all, in rats, you give them a high fructose diet and they instantly, within weeks, become so metabolic syndrome, high lipids, high fatty liver, um, they'll get, develop diabetes in a couple of months. You know, it is amazing how sensitive rats are to a high fructose diet. But at the same time, there are a huge contingent of scientists out there who say the high glucose diet causes high glucose peaks, causes high fructose peaks, and that's true, it does, and that high glucose and high fructose uh, high insulin, high glucose peaks, high insulin peaks, and that high glucose and insulin exposure is what is promoting cardiovascular disease, diabetes, metabolic disease. Now you've heard this before, but it's usually couched in the language of glycemic index. I'm sure you've all heard the phrase glycemic index. Most often you hear it in the Nutrisystems diet commercial where they're saying their diet is based on the proven science of the low glycemic index. And so when you look at the data for glucose versus fructose, I want you to go back and think about that glycemic index. Okay. Anyway, both fructose and glucose have evidence to suggest that there are problems in the diet that we consume. So if we want to figure out why sugar consumption is associated with metabolic disease, we need to first separate glucose from <laughs> fructose to figure out what's happening. And that's what we did. So we compared the effects of consuming fructose and glucose on body composition, lipids, and insulin sensitivity. We fed men and women for 10 weeks. 25% of their energy requirement as fructose or glucose sweetened beverages. They were all overweight to obese. They were 40 to 72 years of age. And this is our study design. Um, the important part I want you to realize is for two weeks, our subjects lived at the CCRC. This is the very same CCRC that you saw in 60 Minutes, for those of you who caught the 60 Minutes show. Mm -hmm. They lived there for two whole weeks. We controlled their diet, we controlled their activity level, and we, every single day, they underwent experimental procedures, sometimes two or three different experimental procedures a day. So this was the baseline period, and during this time, they consumed a high complex carbohydrate diet, very low sugar. Then they lived at home for eight weeks and we sent them home with three servings a day of either glucose or fructose sweetened beverages. These beverages provided 25% of their energy requirement. However, they were allowed to eat as little or as much of their regular diet as they wished. Then they came back and lived with us again for another two weeks. We repeated all the same experimental procedures and they again consumed very regimented diets, but this time they also consumed their sugar sweetened beverage. And I'll give you an idea of what the diets look like. This was pretty much during baseline, the breakfast, the lunch, the dinner. And then they came back for the intervention and the diets were almost the same as this, except less bread because they had their sugar sweetened beverage. Less potato chip, less bread, here's the sugar sweetened beverage instead. And again, less bread, no crackers, there's the sugar sweetened beverage. So as you can see, the diets actually are sort of similar with just this cup here being the big difference. Okay, that's our diet. <coughs> so, let's start with body weight, body fat, and subcutaneous and visceral fat. 
Now, remember, we had the inpatient periods and no big prize since they could only eat exactly what we prepared and we gave everybody exactly their calculated energy requirement. Weight didn't change during the inpatient periods. But during that eight-week eight outpatient period, that's the period that they lived at home, drank the beverages, and ate as little or as much as they want, they gained weight. However, both groups gained exactly the same amount. So, actually that was kind of disappointing. We actually went into this study pretty convinced that subjects consuming fructose would gain more weight than the subjects consuming glucose. Later at the end of the talk, you can ask me why we thought that would happen if you're interested. And so it was disappointing. Wow, we went through all this work and they weren't even different. <laughs> but then we found that something was different. It wasn't the body weight change. It wasn't the total body fat change. However, there were differences in the visceral versus subcutaneous fat change. Subjects consuming fructose deposited more of their fat <coughs> in the visceral adipose compared to the subcutaneous adipose. Whereas the glucose consuming subjects put more of their fat under the skin which is the more metabolically safe place to store fat than the subjects consuming fructose. Okay? So, even though body weight and body fat were completely comparable in the two groups, we found that sugars, glucose versus fructose, has the ability to come up with different depositions of your fat. Now, the big question right now then is, do we see this with sucrose and or high fructose corn syrup? There's still a lot of work to do, but just lately there was a group in Denmark. They had a six month study and their subjects consumed either one liter a day of sucrose sweetened coke or they consume the same number of calories as low fat milk or they consumed aspartame or they consumed water and as you can see the sucrose consuming group and the low fat milk group gained about 1.2 kilograms these two groups gained less, but there was no significant differences between the group. However, here's the increase in visceral fat in the subjects that consume sucrose. So this suggests that fructose in the sucrose is still having this effect of favoring fat deposition in the visceral fat, which is the place we least want it to be, even when it's consumed as sucrose. That clear to everybody? Okay, then let's move on. All right, we investigated the effects of glucose versus fructose on lipids and lipid metabolism. We looked at the lipids, we looked at fat making in the liver, which is called de novo lipogenesis or DNL. We looked at the process by which triglyceride gets turned into energy, that's called fatty acid oxidation. And then we also looked at the activity of the enzyme that's responsible for clearing triglyceride out of the blood. That enzyme is called LPL, its long name is lipoprotein lipase activity. So, what did we find? First of all, fasting triglyceride. Now this is the number one measurement for all research studies, but also in the doctor's office. Your doctor talks about fasting triglycerides and your fasting cholesterol levels more than any other thing he talks about when he's looking at your clinical report. Well, we found that 
In subjects consuming fructose, absolutely no changes in fasting triglyceride. Whereas there was actually a slight increase in the subjects consuming glucose. This actually surprised us because it's totally the opposite in rats. You give rats fructose and their fasting triglycerides go up through the roof immediately. But we also looked at what we call postprandial triglycerides. And we do that by making our poor subjects lie in bed all day and we collect blood samples from them every 30 minutes to an hour. And so 36 blood samples are collected from 8 a.m. in the morning all the way to 8 a.m. the next morning. All right? We do it during the baseline period when they're consuming the complex carbohydrate. So that's the black line on both sides. This is when both groups were consuming the complex carbohydrate. In blue here, you see when the triglyceride levels all day long of the subjects when they were consuming glucose. Here it is, you can see the increase in the fasting period, but once they start eating, there's really no difference. And in fact, there tends to be a decrease in triglyceride levels in subjects consuming glucose compared to when they consume the complex carbohydrate. But over here in red is the subjects consuming fructose. Red lines right on top of the black line, so no change in the fasting triglycerides. But then shortly after lunch, <coughs> very big changes. And these changes last from lunch to after lunch all the way to about 4 a.m. in the morning. So fasting triglycerides, no change in subjects consuming fructose. But postprandial triglycerides, a very different story. Now what do you think is possibly if having high levels of triglyceride in your blood is a problem, where do you think we should be measuring it? Here or here? Okay, we've measured lots of other lipids too. All these lipids here, apolipoprotein B, it's a lipoprotein, LDL cholesterol, small dense LDL, oxidized LDL, and remnant lipoprotein triglyceride and cholesterol. They were all measured because they are, have all been shown to be risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Basically, when these go up, your risk for cardiovascular disease increases too. And here you see the bars are in red are the changes of these risk factors for subjects consuming fructose. <coughs> Blue is the glucose. And each time, glucose does not change significantly or at all. And each change time, fructose goes up very significantly. So why are we seeing these changes? Is it possible that the liver is turning fructose into fat and not turning glucose into fat? And that's why we measured de novo lipogenesis. That is the process by which the liver says sugar becomes fat. Well, we found in the subjects consuming glucose, this is their difference in their de novo lipogenesis compared to baseline. And here's zero, and you can see it's very near zero all the way through. But here is the fructose subjects. Once they, this is in the fasting period, lower de novo lipogenesis, but then once they start eating that fructose, increase de novo lipogenesis. But we also looked at fat burning. Our poor subjects had to wear this oxygen mask and lie very still. It's called indirect calorimetry. We measured it for 10 minutes every hour for 17 hours. We did it at baseline, again at black. This is when they consume the complex carbohydrate. And in blue is when they 
here when they consume glucose. Again, this is how well is the body burning your fat off. For glucose, you can see no difference. Pretty much overlapping lines, it's the same. But over here with the fructose, as soon as they have that big fructose drink, fatty acid oxidation goes down. All the way till it's even almost considered negative. Here's lunch, fatty acid oxidation goes down. Dinner, fatty acid oxidation goes down. Actually, this totally makes sense. Our bodies are not stupid. They don't make fat and burn fat at the very same time. So if our livers are taking that fructose and making fat out of it, they're not going to be burning the fat off at the same time because they only do one thing at a time when it comes to making or burning. They're making, their burning fat off is inhibited. And then I talked about that enzyme, LPL. It's the one that's responsible for getting the fat out of blood and into the places where it can be used or stored. So it can be stored in fat, our fat deposits, or it can be, LPL can get it into muscle where it can be utilized for energy. Well, LPL basically was unchanged when subjects were fasted but it increased when subjects consumed glucose and tended to decrease when subjects consumed fructose. So what does this all mean? It means that, first of all, consumption of fructose increased levels of postprandial triglycerides and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, whereas glucose did not. However, the changes in fasting triglyceride concentrations are not a reliable index of what fructose does to lipids. So any study in which they say fructose is no problem, we fed it for 10 weeks to our subjects and fasting triglycerides did not change, you can say, excuse me, what did the postprandial triglycerides do? That's the important question. Then, what causes these high postprandial triglyceride levels? Well, our data suggests there's three contributors. The fact that our liver turns the sugar into triglyceride. The fact that the fat is no longer being turned into energy. And the fact that LPL is not clearing it out of the blood as quickly as it was, are all causing the triglyceride levels to go up when we, postprandial triglycerides to go up, levels to go up when we consume fructose. Now, this is the potential mechanisms by which fructose may cause all these changes. Now, this is actually a very simplified schematic, <laughs> but the last time I tried to present it and explain it to an audience, four people in the front row fell asleep. <laughs> so, I am going to make one point very strongly here, and I think it's understandable, and I think it's interesting, and it's something you can take with you. But basically, I'll explain it this way. The real reason there is such a difference between glucose and fructose has to do with this big star right here, regulation by energy stats. Now, I'm not going to even try and explain what that means scientifically. Instead, I'm going to give you an, an analogy. When sucrose, fructose, all sugars leave the intestine, they get pulled into the portal vein. The portal vein's first stop is the liver, very first stop. That gives the liver first rights to all the sugar we eat. The liver gets to say, hey, all for me, and pull all that sugar in, or the liver can say, nah, 
don't want it, in that sugar will pass right through the liver and go to um, the other parts of the body where it can be used. Now, if the liver pulls it in, it can send it down several pathways, the main pathway being turning that sugar into energy. Now, I want you to think of that pathway by which the liver turns sugar into energy as an assembly line in a factory. That there is this long conveyor belt, and along the conveyor belt we have little enzyme workers stationed. And each enzyme station, they make little changes to the sugar, such that by the time we get to over here on the assembly line, we have energy. Now, there's a very big difference between the glucose assembly line and the fructose assembly line. The very first enzyme at the glucose assembly line is in constant communication with the energy <coughs> storehouse manager. He's saying, do we need energy? And if the manager of the energy storehouse in the liver says, no, the storehouse is full of energy, we don't need it, that enzyme shuts down the assembly line, does not load any more glucose onto the assembly line. That keeps the liver from pulling any more glucose in. So all that glucose that was in the sugar-sweetened beverage bypasses the liver, goes to the muscle, goes to the brain, goes to the fat stores. Fructose is different. That assembly, that enzyme at the beginning of the assembly line for fructose is paying absolutely no attention to any communication from the energy storehouse manager, not even listening to him. Instead, he's taking every available fructose and loading it onto the conveyor belt. So it's going down the assembly line. As a result, this allows the liver to pull in all the fructose that was in that sugar-sweetened beverage. All of it. And this leads to a problem. Eventually, this assembly line is so overloaded that a new assembly line has to get opened up. And that's the assembly line that takes it off the energy assembly line and puts it on the fat-making assembly line. And that's where we get the extra fat. And that's why we get the extra fat. No communication here at the beginning. Lack of regulation by energy status. Does everybody get that? Okay. So when the liver makes extra fat, it does two things. That fat gets sent into the blood and causes all these negative processes that leads to small dense LDL, oxidized LDL, and it also increases hepatic lipid. That's lipid levels in the liver. All right. So, the sugars we consume, sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, is there any evidence that this is happening when we consume these sugars? Well, de novo lipogenesis, I'm doing the study now, the results aren't going to be ready for two more years. At this point, nobody else has done it, so we can't say for sure. I don't have positive evidence that fructose, I'm sorry, that sucrose or high fructose corn syrup increased de novo lipogenesis. However, that same study in Denmark I told you about where the subjects consume sucrose for six months, we have evidence that they have increased triglyceride in their liver, increased hepatic lipid. This was very big evidence, very important evidence very significant increases in these subjects that we did not see in the subjects consuming the low-fat milk. So that's important evidence. With regard to dyslipidemia, that means high triglycerides and high cholesterol and high risk factors for cardiovascular disease in the blood, we have data dating all the way back from 1980 or even 1979 that shows our sugars 
increase lipids in the blood. And this one, this one, this one, these are all about sucrose. High fructose corn syrup, this is my study that just got published last October, and we're going to talk about that one a little more because it's my study. <laughs> okay, so this is a much easier study than the one I told you about before where our subjects lived with us for two weeks at a time. This time they only lived with us for three and a half days. Much easier. They're also younger. They're 18 to 40 years of age. They're more hungry for money, so it's really easy to recruit them. <laughs> and um, this study is going very well. We have actually um, have studied up to 160 subjects by now, and, but we still have one more year worth of study to do before this entire study is done. Under this study is the one I told you about that we're measuring de novo lipogenesis to. Okay, for this study, they go, they live with us for the three and a half days. Those meals I showed you previously, the exact same deal. They get matched meals. Here, no sugar. Here, they're assigned sugar with their meals. And then, experimental procedures, and the important part about this inpatient period is nobody went to a party the night before we drew the blood. <laughs> they lived with us. And when you're working with 18 to 40 year olds, really 18 to 29, that's really important. Okay, so. Up here again, we have the fasting triglycerides. Interesting, the same thing we saw before. An increase in the subjects consuming glucose, but fasting triglycerides were not significantly increased in the subject consuming fructose or high fructose corn syrup. However, here is those postprandial triglycerides um, indexed as the 24-hour area under the curve. That means we took that graph and measured all the space underneath. <coughs> Decreased in subjects consuming glucose, increased in subjects consuming fructose, and also increased in subjects consuming high fructose corn syrup. And then also the late night peak, which occurs around 11 p.m. at night was significantly increased in subjects consuming fructose and high fructose corn syrup. Now, the interesting thing is we saw the pattern we expected when we look at the postprandial triglycerides. Highest increase here and not as high an increase here. Same pattern here. But when we looked at fasting LDL, and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including apolipoprotein B, we didn't see that pattern. Instead, we saw the highest changes in the subjects consuming high fructose corn syrup. Significant changes in subjects consuming fructose, absolutely no changes in subjects consuming glucose, but each time the high fructose <laughs> corn syrup had the highest fasting levels of risk factors. This is very interesting, and at this point, we haven't explained it. Whether there turns out to be, you remember when we study fructose, it's bad, glucose is no problem, but whether you putting them together causes some kind of synergistic reaction that makes them worse when they're together than either of them are by themselves, we don't know yet, but it's an interesting question. Okay, moving on. We investigated the effects of fructose versus glucose on insulin sensitivity. Now, uh, let me explain what insulin sensitivity is. This is the big risk factor for diabetes. You need your insulin to work. And scientists say you need your body to be sensitive to insulin. And as you become insensitive to insulin, that's what diabetes is. Now, in children, 
They're ha they have diabetes because they have no insulin. A child with type 1 diabetes. But in adults, people with type 2 diabetes often have very high levels of insulin. It's there, but it's not working. Why is it not working? Well, think of it as a key. You go, you know, you have a key, and that key used to open the door just great every single time, and then eventually there's like some kind of wearing process on the key or in the latch, and you go like that, and it sometimes won't open the door, and you have to do it for a long, 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 long time, and finally that door opens. In a way, that's what insulin sensitivity is, because it's insulin's job to get open the door to the cell so glucose can get in. And if that key will not open the door, then glucose stays in the blood and you have diabetes. So basically, you need your keys to work well. And a key that will not work well is not is insulin sensitivity. Does that make sense? Yep. So we measured that. The, someone asked me already, what are the signs of prediabetes? And these are the signs that a doctor looks for when you have prediabetes. Fasting glucose and fasting insulin. And in both cases, Glucose actually caused a significant decrease in fasting glucose, whereas at two weeks, eight weeks, and 10 weeks, fructose increased fasting glucose levels in subjects consuming fructose. Uh, same thing in, for fasting insulin. There was no significant changes in the subjects consuming glucose but increases in the subjects consuming fructose. And then we actually measured insulin sensitivity with a very scientific test using stable isotopes. Insulin sensitivity was not affected in subjects consuming glucose, but decreased by 17% in subjects consuming fructose. So our conclusions are consumption of fructose sweetened beverages, increased fasting glucose, fasting insulin, decreased insulin sensitivity, whereas consumption of glucose did not. So why does this happen? It all goes back to, remember I said when that assembly line gets shunted and the fructose starts getting changed into fat. Some of the fat goes into the blood, but some of it stays in the liver. When it stays in the liver, it is what's growing up the key. The key does not work well when there is fat in the <clears throat> liver. Then the same thing becomes true in a muscle cell. When there's lots of fat in the blood, the muscle cells start taking and storing fat. That's when the key won't work well in the muscle cell either because fat in the cell causes problems for the key. So here we have fat in the liver and then here we have the very scientific process by which this leads to increased fasting glucose increased fasting insulin and insulin resistance or decreased insulin sensitivity. It's the same thing. So, does sucrose and high fructose corn syrup decrease insulin sensitivity? Now, in my two-week study, in my very young subjects, the answer was no. So, either my subjects were too young the study was too short, or sucrose and high fructose corn syrup do not cause decreases in insulin sensitivity. However, there's two old studies that suggest it could, at least in overweight subjects who are older than my subjects, middle-aged, and also when 
sucrose is consumed with a high fat diet. And that is something I haven't studied yet. When I feed my subjects diets, in two weeks they have risk changes in risk factors for cardiovascular disease and they're kind of eating healthy food. They're on a relatively moderate fat diet. They are not on a high fat diet. And that is something scientifically we really need to look at because the truth is people who consume a lot of sugar are not on low fat diets usually. They usually go hand in hand. Yes, soda does not have fat, but that's not the only place we're getting our sugar. We're getting our sugar from cookies, cakes, candy, chocolate, muffins, and all of those also have very high fat content. And so these data suggest that when we put sugar and fat together, that that's when we're going to see very quick changes in insulin sensitivity, which again increases risk for diabetes. So, here's our overall conclusion. With regard to fructose and glucose, it's pretty darn clear. Consumption of fructose increased visceral adiposity, promoted all sorts of lipid problems that increases risk for cardiovascular <coughs> disease, and decreased insulin sensitivity in overweight and obese older adults. Consumption of glucose does not, despite promoting comparable weight gain. And I underline that because that is such an important point. We have gotten very focused as we're in the middle of this obesity epidemic, blaming it solely on the obesity. Oh my gosh, if people would just not get fat, we wouldn't have these problems. And believe me, the sugar industry would love to convince everybody it has nothing to do with the sugar, it's just the fact that everybody's eating too many calories. Well, our data shows very clearly it's not just eating too many calories that's a problem, though it is a problem. It's also the source of the extra calories that are promoting the extra weight that are a problem too. So we have to care about both of them. Not just how much we eat, but what we eat. Now, our conclusions with regard to high fructose corn syrup and sucrose. The epidemiological data, which I showed you clear back at the beginning, plus the current evidence, and the most current evidence is mine, which shows that consuming High fructose corn syrup beverages increase risk factors for cardiovascular disease in subjects as young as 18 and very, very lean, many of them. And also this Denmark study that showed consumption of sucrose sweetened beverages at about 20% of energy increased visceral fat, liver fat, and also risk factors for cardiovascular disease. You put these two studies together, along with the epidemiological data, and to me that suggests that sugar consumption could indeed be a contributing factor to the epidemics of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And it also suggests very strongly to me that that maximal upper limit of 25% of energy requirement from added sugar suggested in our dietary guidelines for Americans definitely needs to be reevaluated. Uh, here's some of the incredibly wonderful people um, that are helping me with my studies and I couldn't do it without them. Okay. <coughs> This is my favorite part, so. <laughs> How much sugar a year does the average person consume? Well, um, oh gosh, there is, that does, somebody has that number off the top of their head, Lustig certainly does, but they, right now, they say the average person is consuming around 18% of their calories as added sugar. Now, 
Unfortunately, that number is completely based on self-reported data. And self-reported data is some of the most suspect data that scientists collect. When studies have been done where they collect self-reported data from people and then also measure their energy burning, they find that, wow, if this self-reported data is correct, then these people should be about 30 pounds underweight. <laughs> and that happens over and over and over again. There's actually three studies that have shown that very clearly, that people underreport their food consumption by any, very, as much as 15 to 30 percent. And then what really muddies the picture is there's two things they especially underreport. Guess what they are? Sugar and fat. Exactly, sugar and fat. So you have to look at that 18%, but that's the number they use. And when you multiply that out, they come up with pounds of sugar. But I've actually forgotten the number. In the I got 58. Oh, OK. I didn't believe. <laughs> Yeah. When you say added sugar, do you mean sprinkled on top, put in your coffee, those And things? anything added to your processed foods also. Okay. Right. What I don't mean is the sugar that's in milk, the sugar that's in yogurt, naturally. You, I do mean the sugar they add to yogurt um, to but make it sweet, but not, fruit. but not the sugar in fruit. And there's two reasons why we don't count the sugar in fruit. One is, and you can see this if you go to the 60 Minutes website, um, they enter sugar is toxic. They show a lot of the film clips that didn't make the final television segment simply because of lack of time. And one of them is this display that my lovely staff made in which shows the amount of fruit you have to consume in one day to equal the amount of sh sugar that is in the three drinks my subjects consume. It's actually a mind-boggling amount. It's nine different fruits, but it's several of the fruits, including three apricots, two plums, half a cantaloupe, 16 strawberries, an eighth of a watermelon, an apple, an orange, a peach, and I think I've forgotten a couple, but in okay, half a cantaloupe. But it's actually more fruit than most people can consume without getting you know, gastrointestinal upset. <laughs> the other thing that's important to understand about fruits is they contain fiber, phytochemicals, flavonoids, all sorts of incredibly beneficial compounds that we know what some of them do, but we don't know what all of them do. Some of them might even block the kind of pathways that I was showing you in that complicated schematic, which turns fructose into fat. It's never been tested. We don't even know. You know, we're finally getting around to measuring fat making in people consuming sugar. We're the first ones that are doing it on a long-term study. Why is it taking us so long to get around to studying this? This is important. So believe me, we have a long ways to go before we know how orange juice, fresh oranges, apricots, dried apricots, there's a million questions out there, and I would love to answer them all. Um, unfortunately, don't. Research money is really hard to get. <laughs> I don't know if I'll live long enough to get it all to answer all those questions. <laughs> uh, a lot of the uh, foods that you were uh, showing were containing 55% complex carbohydrates. Um, car complex carbohydrates are broken down into sugars. They're broken down into glucose oh. and only glucose. Right. Yes. So if you have you done any studies where you actually reduce the uh, starting point? of your, your glucose intake because if you have the uh, you know 55% complex and you add on top of that, the question is, is there any studies done where your baseline is lower than the glucose intake 55% complex carbs would give you? Well, I have written a research grant that I hope very much to get funded that will answer your question.
Your question basically, to me, is the question that I'm dying to know the answer to. What is healthier? Let's assume sugar is super low. What do you replace that sugar with? Is complex carbohydrate the best replacement or is fat? And that's the study I want to do. So I'm hoping to do a study in which I'm looking at four different diets. The low fat, low sugar diet, which would be super high in complex carbohydrate. The low fat, um, let me see if I get this right, high sugar diet. The low, the high fat, high sugar diet, and the high fat, low sugar diet. So basically, every combination of the four I want to do. And if for this study, I'm going to make every single meal. My staff will make every single meal. Everybody will get the precise calories they need to maintain body weight. Most of the studies we have done comparing the high fat and the high carb diet have been done in people in which they're trying to decide what's the best weight loss diet. I'm not interested in what's the best weight loss diet here. I'm interested in what's the best day to day, how people should be eating diet. And as a nutritionist, I'm a little appalled too that we don't know the answer. And we need the answer. And so I am, really, this is, I believe, the most, you know, I think these studies have been important, but that one's the most important. And I really am hoping it gets funded. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, there's someone here for, yeah. I, I, this might be really silly, but is the liver that smart that it can decide whether it's going to take this in or? Uh, it's you know it's an interesting question and there is a good answer for that it really has to do with evolution okay in ev we kind of evolved to survive now when we were evolving what was the source of carbohydrate that we ate the most of obviously glucose because it's in all the plant foods it's in all the oats, all the potatoes, all the rice, all the wheat. Everything we eat as a staple, that's where glucose is. So how did we evolve to be healthy? By having livers who knew how to handle glucose, right? And livers that were smart enough to say, oh, no, plenty of energy. Send the glucose to the rest of the body, okay? Now, why didn't we evolve smart, a liver smart enough to do this with fructose? Because our bodies were not exposed to fructose mm -hmm. until we learned to take the sucrose out of sugar cane. That's the first time, and that's only like 300 years ago, that we learned to pull sugar out of sugar cane. Up to then, unless you live next to a beehive, you were exposed to very little fructose. So our bodies did not evolve knowing how to handle fructose. That's the answer to your question. Yeah. Do any of these studies pay attention to ethnicity? Oh, yes. We um, have everything documented, and there is absolutely no doubt that some of these processes are so much worse in other ethnic groups. Hispanics, they get fatty liver so easily. And the black population, their um, lipid responses to sugar are so high. It's not even all the same responses. So there can be different responses to different ethnic groups. And so, yes, we not only keep careful track for every NIH study I do, I have to prove to NIH that I am studying the correct proportion of all the ethnic groups for my area, my area being the Sacramento area that represents. Um, luckily for this um, young 
the study I'm doing now, it's been absolutely no problem because um, we just recruit on Craigslist and all the ethnic groups are very, very, the young kids are very into Craigslist and um, we've got a wonderful mixture. It was miserable in the um, older study, the study with the um, 40 to 72 year olds, especially getting Asians. Asians are Older Asians are very resistant to being involved in our research studies. It's like they weren't trusting us enough to let us do this, the kind of things we wanted to do. We never got a single Asian, and NIH was so totally on my case. But luckily for these, this younger group, the second generation Asians, nope, they're right there, you know, as long as we're willing to pay them, they're happy to be involved. Yeah. So the reason that they make fructose is you have to use less per drink to get the same sweetness? Um, they, that's kind of possibly what started out to be the reason that the Japanese may have decided it was a good idea to make high fructose corn syrup. But it caught on in this country probably because of the sugar subsidies that I'm sorry, I said sugar, I mean, corn, corn subsidies, yeah. yeah, that you could make high fructose corn syrup cheaper than sucrose. And boy did, high, when we made high fructose corn syrup, sucrose prices really went down because they were king and so, but the truth is they're really this villainization of high fructose corn syrup and acting like sucrose is no problem at all is completely unwarranted. Um, the study, the Denmark study, was done in subjects consuming sucrose. So clearly there are problems associated with consuming sucrose. My data in subjects consuming sucrose has not been published yet. <coughs> I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I have no reason to think the two sugars are going to be different. And they shouldn't be that different. One's mostly 55% fructose, 45% sugar, sucro, glucose, and then sucrose is 50-50. That's not that different. Yes? Um, my question is how do you best communicate this? Because for example, I think we all know like a glass of soda with sugar in it or whatever is, is not the best beverage you can choose. But my sister's favorite beverage is a name brand coffee shop's chai latte grande, <laughs> which now you can walk up to the board that says 42 grams of sugar. But um, she doesn't look at it as equivalent to a glass of soda and 40, when you hear it as percents versus grams versus teaspoons, it, it, people don't know what it means. Okay. How do you best convey that to the general public? Okay, if we follow the American Heart Association guidelines, which I think are reasonable, basically that's 25 grams of sugar a day for a woman. So, so that the high latte had is a Yes, <laughs> especially too because there's probably a good number of grams of fat in there too. And again, it's my belief you put the two together and you're going to have even worse problems than anything I showed you up here. Um, you know, it's all about teaching people that no one's really going to be able to consume very much sugar on 25 a day. Basically, you should be saying, I don't consume sugar, and then every once in a while, you know, I might go over 25, you know, 50 or even 100 on special occasions. But the trouble is, if special occasion is anytime someone in the office has a birthday, you're in trouble. I mean, there's always special occasions and people bring uh, sugar to anything that um, is that, you know, the celebratory, that's exactly the word. Um, we play tournament bridge 
every Saturday. And every Saturday there's lovely desserts at the Bridge Club. And, um, you know, if I gave myself permission to consider that a special occasion, I would be on a high sugar diet, definitely. So we just have to get rigid and not think of it as much as 25 grams a day, because that's really so insignificant that you're not going to really get to have anything that is super high in sugar. Basically, you say, I'm not going to consume this stuff expect, except on very special occasions. Is really what you're going to have to, you know, if you really want to follow that guideline. Yeah. Regarding cardiovascular disease, um, I saw a relationship between the fructose and sucrose and lipids. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also, of course, that's related to weight gain. What about exercise? If a person is doing a lot of exercise, burning a lot of calories, uh, not getting overweight, is the fructose and sucrose still going to be a problem for, for cardiovascular? Well, the, there's two ways to look at that. It's if you are burning that sugar as quickly as it's getting into your liver, then the fructose can't be turned into fat. But it's all about timing, okay? Um, you run a marathon and you eat a big fructose-containing drink. You're going to be at such a calorie deficit that it's going to be used to get your energy reserves up. So it's not going to be the problem. However, let's say you ran three miles in the morning, you had your usual meals, and then at night time you consume a huge fructose load. If you are not at a calorie deficit, your body, your liver is just as likely to turn it into fat as somebody else's. So your question is incredibly complicated with regard to um, the timing. <coughs> Personally, I think if we did a study in which we took fructose, the same amount that our subjects ate, and instead gave them three servings a day, we turned it into 12 servings a day, one every hour, I don't think we would see the effects because it's all about overloading the liver at any given time, I believe, that's causing the problem. So if it was tiny bits of fructose all day long, rather than this great big glass of it at the end of the day, I think we would see a very different triglyceride response. Another one of those studies I want to do. Right, oh, absolutely, yeah. In your study, you say look, about 20 to 25 percent of the energy comes from sugar. What does the other 75 to 80 percent mostly come from? In energy? Okay, um, so when we um, provide the meals, they're always 55 percent of the meal is carbohydrate. Now, during baseline, it's all complex carbohydrate. During the intervention period, it's 30% complex carbohydrate, 25% sugar. Then the other portion is always 30% fat, which is considered a moderate fat diet, and the other is 15% protein. So that's what it is. 55, 30, 15, that equals 100. There was somebody right there. Yeah. In the study that you want to do with high fat, low sugar diet, um, what fats would be used? Because there's oh. so many processes and processes raw. You are so absolutely right. So to start the study, I am not going to pick the ideal fat or the most negative fat. Instead, it's going to be a 33% saturated, 33% mono, 33% pollen. Now, that's the best I can do with one study. And that is pretty much what the average person 
consume who is not being careful about picking their fats, you know, wisely. Instead, they're just eating what's available. And so, but that's an excellent question. Just and a concern about really refined um, or hydrogenated versus right. you know, a whole saturated fat. Right. In I will pick, you know, a level of trans fat, for example, and it will be absolutely essential that I have to make sure all the diets contain exactly that much trans fat because there is data showing trans fat has very significant effects on cholesterol levels, so I can't allow that to be uh, um, variable in the study. You are very right. Sugar being addictive segment, um, there's a lot of work being done there. Mm -hmm. And um, that part, it certainly hasn't been proven, but it looks like Feels give us time. Pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, give it time. You know. Yeah, we were actually going to start this out with that question. Oh yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Raise your hand if you had sugar at some point today. Like you know you had extra sugar just out of curiosity. Oh. <laughs> and uh, about, raise your hand if you think you have some sort of sugar addiction. Like you crave it and want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, how many of you though know the feeling of having once? consumed a lot of sugar, then made up your mind, all right, I'm going to cut sugar, and at the beginning it was hard, and then it got easier and easier and easier over time. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah. And so that, to me, is one of those things that makes it very plausible, <laughs> easy to believe, yeah. that sugar you know, can be a very addictive. What things have you eliminated from your diet with your knowledge? In other words, gum bearers? And well, <laughs> uh, I do eat a low-fat diet simply because I can't afford the calorie-dense foods. And so, you know, long time ago I learned that, you know, butter on margarine, whatever kind of fat on bread, made bread, bread way too palatable, and I overate it when I put, and I try to avoid anything in which I'm getting 100 calories in one mouthful. I only get 2,000 calories a day. I want more than 20 mouthfuls. So because of that, I have always, since the early 80s, eaten a very low-fat diet. Now, it's my research that taught me, oh, so I don't get to have sugar instead of fat. <laughs> so now it's definitely low fat and low sugar. Um, we have an enormous garden and it's beautiful. It's one of my favorite things to go out and watch the plants grow. <laughs> and um, so I take great pride in the fact that I would say 75% of the food we eat come from the garden and that we know exactly what was used on it, you know, no sprays, not anything. And so I feel really good about that. However, at the same time, the last thing I would ever tell a mother is don't buy fruit and vegetable because it may have pesticide because what is the mother's option for feeding her kids? Is it better to give them candy? You know, which probably came from grain products that, or you know, plant some of the plant products had pesticides anyway. You know, so I don't like to be super. Oh my gosh, I never, never, never touch pesticides because I don't want people to think they should be avoiding fruit and vegetable. It's unfortunate, and but I certainly understand why farmers, you know, have to deal with. Um, pass, but it, the fruit and vegetables still represents our healthiest alternatives, our healthiest options for eating, and if you can't grow your own, and you don't have farmer's markets near you, it's still better to get it from the grocery store, so, but yes, I, um, 
Instead of saying, I definitely avoid fat, I definitely avoid sugar, then I try to think of it in terms of what I feel good about when I eat. And I feel good about eating whole grain oatmeal. I feel good about eating lots and lots of bean products, you know, which are really one of the world's most incredibly nutritious foods. So, and um, I feel good about eating the fresh stuff out of our garden. Yeah? I think that was a 90% step to, to answer, but if you have one piece of advice for 10 and 13 year old girls regarding diet and lifestyle, what would it be? Um, so I don't get to say fat and sugar. Yeah, I would say definitely avoid the sugar and don't stop exercising. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I wish so badly I never quit that swim team when I was 15. <laughs> um, I was on a swim team all the way up to 15 and was at a completely ideal weight and then quit and you know started gaining 10 pounds a year. So by the time I graduated from high school, I was wearing size 8, 16 pants and I never made the connection. Nobody exercised back then. Why should I? You know, the guys all did their little sports things, but this was before Title IX. I played on the volleyball team. <laughs> and, but other than that, there were no sports at my school, and it never occurred to me that, wow, dropping the swim team caused me to gain weight. No, I just kept trying to eat less. So it wasn't until I went to AR and... Um, inadvertently ended up in a class with Al Beta. I don't know if any of you, oh, I forget, this isn't Sacramento. <laughs> he used to be an Olympic coach uh, for track, and he was very motivating, and I haven't stopped exercising since. But, boy, I wish I had <laughs> never stopped in the first place. <laughs> Besides the beans, what's your primary source of your protein? Um, low fat chicken, you know, and um, do eat pork, do eat beef, but it's not like here's the pork and here is the vegetable and here's a piece of bread. It is here is the rice or the pasta or whatever dal or whatever we're eating as our grain that day and then the meat is just mixed in. We eat lots and lots of soup. Our, garden is producing yellow squash by the bucket loads, mm -hmm. it all gets goes in the freezer and that squash becomes a soup and lots of times the meat is in the soup too. Um, so, but yes, I definitely, um, one of my special occasion foods is pork stirrups. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you feel about the success people are on the high fat, high protein, like paleo with their diets? Um, that's one of the reasons why I want to do the study. Um, it is my belief that complex, you know, carbohydrates, especially in the whole grain form, are the healthiest way to eat. But I have not looked at those lipid profiles, mm -hmm. comparing it in the way I want to compare it. You know, completely, stand, you know, control all those variables so we really know. Mm -hmm. And like I said, most of the studies in which we have looked at these are in low calorie diets. We need to do them in, you know, regular what people eat everyday diets. Yeah. And so I really can't answer that question and talk done the study. I know for myself that the High complex carbohydrate diet works for me. For you, yeah. yeah, it works. But I also don't think I have any issues related to burning carbohydrates that some people clearly have. Mm -hmm. You use classic Coke for a lot of your examples. What if people will change to diet Coke? That's um, the question, usually the first one I get. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. You can definitely. 
still here, and you're going to hear more because um, there's a paper that I just reviewed the other day. I rejected it, but it's undoubtedly going to go to another journal. And it's going to get published sooner or later, and it's going to say that um, rats, especially rats that are overweight and female, when they consume saccharin sweetened water, they gain more weight than rats that consume sugar sweetened water. And reviewing that paper led me to go through the literature from top to bottom about anything, aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, cyclamates, anything we have. And Basically, when it comes to weight gain and metabolic effects, not one human study has ever shown that they have caused weight gain. That the study in the Denmark subjects, all those subjects were overweight subjects, and half of them were women. Six months, they consumed an entire liter of aspartame sweetened Coke every day. And their change in weight was 0.1%. So basically, no change at all. So anyway, even though you're going to keep hearing about rat studies that say, oh, sugar substitutes make you eat more, there is no evidence for it in humans. Now, that said, this is the longest study we have done an intervention study in humans using a sugar substitute is that Denmark study for six months. Do I know that 10 years of consuming one liter of aspartame sweetened cola won't have any sort of other toxicological effects, you know, that may promote something like cancer? No. I don't know that. I don't know that at all. Nobody does because the longest study is six months. Metabolically, the people consuming aspartame looked perfectly fine. No changes, no negative changes at all. All the negative changes were those consuming sucrose. So you kind of have to make a decision. Is it better to drink water maybe than aspartame every day if you're going to drink an entire liter? I would say yes, sounds safer to me. But at the same time, aspartame versus sucrose, and I have no choice, I'll go with the aspartame any day. Because I know what the sucrose does. And I know metabolically that the aspartame doesn't do anything for as long as six months. And um, I'd rather go with what for sure we know. We know the sucrose does have negative effects. But water over aspartame, sure. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, uh, we'll do one last question and then we'll wrap it up and then anyone who has additional questions can come up and talk okay. directly. You didn't mention fish when you were talking about protein. Just oh, I'm sorry. We that eat, was just, yeah, we eat lots of fish, including um, our favorite shrimp. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much for coming.